if they see it, right? They'll, you know, they'll bypass tripping and interference and basically swallow the whistle. How do you get too many men on the ice, not once but twice in overtime? And by the way, they missed one in Chicago. They would have had another <laughs> one, it would have been three, and they showed it later. But <laughs> I actually worked a game, you remember when uh, Boston lost the Stanley Cup to Montreal? That's I was right. working for Hockey Night in Canada, I was doing the color, and yeah. it was uh, Boston playing Montreal. And Boston had the game won, and there was about three, four minutes left in the game. Boston got too many men on the ice. Montreal tied it, wins in overtime, wins the Stanley Cup. Mm. What happens, to, uh, there's a combination of things. First of all, the coaches are telling you who's up. And when they tell you who's up, then you should be saying, if I'm playing center, I got Dubay if he's center. If I'm playing wing, I got uh, You Sunlight, wish you did. Whatever it is, but <laughs> you should be focusing on that player. Mm -hmm. And and sometimes the guys don't focus on that. They see the guy. A guy coming off and they forget the wing center or who's coming and they, they jump on. But more than that, sometimes it's indecision. I think that happened last night on the second the second play. I think Taves was was coming on because someone was coming off and the guy changed his mind by the bench and stayed on. Wow. And and so now you got too many men. The thing is, and if you change too quickly, if the guy's not close enough to the boards and you change, the moment you change, when you hit the ice, if the guy hasn't left the ice, if that puck touches you coming on the ice, then it's six men. Now mm -hmm. you, now you, 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 it's just automatic, and and you see that happen a lot. That the change happens, uh, it's it's not at the last second, and somebody comes on before the guy's off, and, and the puck touches them. So the, the the coaches have to make the players aware constantly who's up, especially after you've had it one time during the game. You got to be going down the line now. Watch your man and make sure you're taking him, and that's the only guy you go for. Right. And the players at the same time have to be very aware that the guy's close enough to the bench, or they're not jumping off when there's play around the bench, and you're going to be on the ice and the puck might strike you. Does the long change ever have anything to do with it? Because sometimes teams, teams really no, get in a bad spot with that. No, not the long change, because it happens on the short change. It'll happen in any change. It's the fact just when you get on the bench, it's what happens sometimes. The guys are. are are really tired yeah. and they don't get to the bench quick enough. They yeah. they know they're coming, but they don't hustle to the bench. Mm. And so a guy is anticipating he's going to get there quicker than he does. He jumps on a little yeah. too soon, and the guy's still got another 15, 20 feet to go. Well, and to, and to touch on what you're talking about earlier, um, when I was watching the Toronto Boston series, they did a split screen where they showed Kessel on one bench and Chara on the other, just to show how Chara was so focused on Kessel. If Kessel stood up. Charo would stand up. He'd put a leg over the board. He'd put a leg over the board. Kessel sits down. Charo sits down. Kessel goes. Charo goes. I mean, it was unbelievable. But you could you could dupe a guy. You could jump out, get back on. I mean, you can you can. You, I mean, yeah, I don't know if you on purpose, but I mean, but that's, that, it's amazing how focused one bench could be on the other, player for player for matchup. Well, it's 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 something you you go over before the game. You know, if, if I'm Boston coach, I'm telling Charo whenever Kessel's on the ice, you're on the ice. Yeah. So he knows. He raced that the, the, the moment that Kessel goes on the ice, Charo knows he's going to be going on. Mm -hmm. right? So and the defenseman that he's replacing has to also realize Kessel's on, I'm getting off, Charo's coming on. Mm -hmm. you, you talk these things over before the game. You talk them over in between periods, and you talk them over on the bench. You make certain that guys are focused on, on who they're replacing. When you were GM of the North Stars and you would play the Blackhawks, I do not recall this, but I might be wrong here. When you would play Savard, one, would you try and match up with Savard? And two, did you ever, back in that day, did you use defensemen against forwards on purpose as matchups, or was it usually center versus center? And that day was probably more center versus center. That's what I thought. Or sometimes it wouldn't even be a wing. You know, you, people would just think that because uh, Savard's a center, the, the center has to check him. Mm -hmm. We might have a good checking wing. So when the play... Starts when they're on the ice, when Savard's on the ice, and, and say it might be McAdams, uh, you know, a guy I want to put on, on Savard. He then takes over on Savard, and he'll go where Savard is, and, and say Smith was a centerman, and he'll play the wing in, say, in our zone, he'll go over and play the wing. You could you could do a number of different things, and, and uh, I actually coached against you. The, the playoffs, I think, it was 82, 84, I can't remember when I, I took over into the playoffs. We, we beat Toronto a couple Played Chicago. That's right. And uh, and so in that series, I I can't remember now, but I think I had Bobby Smith going head, head to head with him quite a bit. I think uh, Bobby Smith was the guy I put on on uh, Savard. I know I beat a dead horse with this, and we're probably all sick of talking about it. But God, I hate seeing Nick Letty in the Blackhawks jersey. I mean, it's just it still just kills me. And you who loved the draft of Nick Letty was our buddy Glenn Sonmore because he's been trying to get the wild to draft a Minnesota kid forever, and yeah. they finally did, and they pulled him up on stage. But, I mean, how, how damaging is that trade long-term to this team? 
Well, long term, you can't replace that. If you think you can go get another guy like that, then you have to either use an asset, a draft choice, mm -hmm. or a player to trade, or sign a free agent. But uh, you had the asset, and you know we all make bad trades, and yeah. that was a bad trade. What do you think was playing right now? I I think that Letty's still playing very well. He's he skates he's, well. He skates well, but he's not going to be. If, if you notice, his ice time is. He takes off down. a little quick sometimes. Yeah, and that's yeah. He, and that's, he takes some chances. His, his ice time's gone down because now the games are, are very close, and and you have to really really watch. You 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 have to think defense first, mm -hmm. and sometimes he thinks offense first. Yeah, and that's and that's why they've limited his ice time. If you were to look at the minutes on guarantee last night, you would have seen uh, Duncan Keith up around fifty minutes, and you probably would have seen uh, Nick. Uh, I'd say in the twenties. Yeah, I've seen him jump up to support yeah. a rush. I'm like, yeah. what do you? If you have the puck, it's one thing. You don't need to be. You don't need to be supporting this rush. Well, you know what's worse is when he takes the puck and he goes deep and doesn't come back out. Yeah. And I think that's the worst part because you can jump up and support if somebody's behind you. You're, you're yeah. supporting because somebody's behind you. But when you go deep. You can't stay deep. You and then he likes, to throw, he likes to throw the pass out to, yeah. towards the blue line, and that's dangerous. Well, I was talking, Judd and I were just talking off the air, and, and he was talking about the play that Krug made last night that Boston uh, got scored on. I think it was the second goal, Judd, yeah, wasn't it? Yeah, 3 2. Yeah, and, and I, I told my grandson, uh, Tyler, to play mm -hmm. defense. Yeah. And, and before the playoffs, uh, when they were going to high school championships uh, this year in the regionals, I, I, I've been talking to him all year about. You don't pass the puck up the middle. And I said, I did the first time I played Boston. I remember coming around the net. I see the middle open. Everybody's flying out of the zone. I think I got the center straight up the ice. Or I turned, skated away, and I made the pass. And it's just like instinct. He knew what I was going to do. He stepped right back over the blue line, intercepted, took a shot in the net. Mm -hmm. I went back to the bench. I was just devastated. And <laughs> Ren Blair came over, put his hand on my shoulder and says, don't worry about it, Louie. He does it to everybody. <laughs> and but it's something sticks in your head. So in your own zone, if you remember Fred Shiro and Judd, yep. he would kill you if you passed the puck across the, across the the front of your net in your own zone, across the ice in your own zone. You never made diagonal passes in your own zone. But what's interesting is when they showed the up top view of that pass, yeah. you you could see why he made the mistake because there's all this there was all this congestion on where the pass should have went, and I think he's thinking to himself, oh, we got this open ice on the right hand side there. But what you don't realize is what you just said. These yeah. guys are good enough. They're going to step right in front yeah. of that thing. Yeah. And, and in fact, they probably lull you into a false sense of security. Exactly so you're right. thinking to yourself, I'm going to make this nice yeah. outlet pass. Yeah. And next thing, you know, it's intercepted to the blue line and you're dead. No, in your own zone, you take the pass straight up. You don't you don't go across the center like that, even if it looks like congestion. At least then the puck's out of the zone. Let them fight for it. Right. You're out of the zone. But when you make it across the your own zone diagonally and it gets intercepted, Bing. That usually happens. The Blackhawks defensively, Louie, to me, toe a very interesting line, though, because if you watch uh, Chalmerson or Keith or Seabrook, they clearly have the green light to be very aggressive. And I would guess what's tough when you're a young defenseman is knowing when to take that and when not to. But there were times last night you would see those defensemen and the veteran defensemen fly into the zone and go deep in the zone, and then the forward would come back to cover for them. But, I mean, that's how skilled this team is. Well, but, it's also coaching. When I played at the university, Mariucci used to say to the team before we went on the ice all the time, when Louis gets the puck, the, the last forward high takes his position. Mm -hmm. Louis goes, the other guy stays back. That's how I led the league in scoring. He knew <laughs> that I was going to go with the puck, and he wanted me to go with the puck. And so you, you coach your players into that, and that's something that every team should be able to know. If you've got a, a, a guy that can handle a puck on defense like a Keith, and by the way, how good is Yarmulson? My God. And I know, so underrated. He's another guy. He's another guy. I had no he's idea. Unbelievable. And but, he's unbelievable. And he also took a shot in that King series that he blocked. I yeah. thought he was dead. Yeah, and I don't think he's going to be there next week because I don't know if they're going to be, be able to afford to keep him. But you're right. He's great. But uh, you know what they're doing a lot of times is pinching. They pinch down low. They're quick, and you shouldn't pinch unless you got way better than a fifty percent chance of doing. But if you see the guy pinching, then the, say your center's high in the zone. He's got to step back. The, the high forwards always got to be cognizant of a defenseman going deep and taking this position. And and the well-coached teams, they do that. Now, we're only one game in. But this is a this is a showcase series for the league. Original oh, six teams, yeah. great markets. It's going to be entertaining. It's probably going to be long. When you think about where the league was six months ago, isn't it unbelievable that it's sitting where it is right now? Because, I mean, this is a great time for them. No, it isn't. I, I, you know, I was never a doubter this was going to happen. I kept saying it over and over. 
six months ago, and I, I get questioned, how do you think this lockout's going to affect it? I says, it won't even affect it. It won't be, it'll be a blip on the screen. Mm -hmm. Hockey fans are the most passionate. They're going to come back. And I did say at the time, he said, now, why? There, I don't know if you guys remember, but there was a guy saying, we should strike the first week or strike the second week. And I said. As a fan, you mean? Yeah. <laughs> I said, now, stop and think about it. Who are you hurting if you strike? Yeah. You already got your money for the tickets. Yeah, right? seriously. And you're staying away. I said, if 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 the Teamsters go on strike and, and uh, you know, they, they can't deliver bread and milk to the uh, grocery store, do you tell your kids? We're not going to have any bread and milk because we're mad because it's a strike. <laughs> no, I mean you're you not gotta, eating. Yeah, you got to remember who's uh, you know who's getting affected. Mm -hmm. They're already paying the price of being locked out, mm -hmm. and the strikes you pay the price of being on strike. So don't you are a third party. Don't get yourself injured because of it. Right. Here's the issue though, and we saw this the year the Rangers won the cup in a lockout or strike shortened season, and this time around, it'll never happen. But this is the ideal season. I love these forty eight game seasons. <laughs> I love them. You're, I gotta see the. You don't East. even have to be forty-eight. Just go to seventy. Okay, it still would be great. But I. But you see my point. I see my point. I've been saying this forever. I love this. I mean, this would be wonderful because you got a higher tempo, more consistent physical game, and and you, every game is more meaningful because there's not as long to make up ground when you when you lose a, a few games. I want to see the East once in a while, though. Yeah, but I it's mean, not going to happen. No, I agree. Well, you can still see the East, but you don't have to. You know, you play less in, in your. In your conference but it won't happen because you got to pay these salaries yeah yeah and it, the toughest thing though louis uh for for casual hockey fans who come to people like us and say i watched the playoffs that's fantastic or the olympic games it's fantastic is you got to caution them because the playoffs are fantastic there's nothing yeah. better to me than playoff hockey right. and the olympics are they're great yeah. but the danger is then that person says you know next october 18th i'm going to flip on the tv and you got to say you're not going to see the same product you know, this, you don't see this in October. You don't see this in November. If you're playing an 82-game season, it just doesn't translate. you got to stay away for the playoffs. Well, yeah, you will see it when the, the rivalries come back. If if you remember us playing Chicago, you saw that every yeah, game. Yeah. You saw it every game. 21-team league days, though, were different to me. That's why you have to focus on divisional rivals. Yep. That's what I think the league's going to get back to. You've got you to play those teams more often. You've got to develop a hate for the other. Playoffs breed contempt. Opposition. That's exactly well, what you do. Well, you need playoff team. You and need, that's why you, yes, we, right. we stayed with the divisional. I love you know it. I love the divisional playoffs. Bill Wirtz was the guy that it's really, genius. really would not let that change at the league level. He was the leader. He was chairman of the board. And boy, he was very, very adamant about keeping. You get you get knocked out of the playoffs by Chicago. You can't wait to see him in October, yeah, yeah. and then it's going to be good. Actually, yeah. you mentioned Bill Wirtz, Louis. Let's bring that up when we come back, as the Blackhawks have undergone a, a transformation. But Bill Wirtz was a pioneer in this league at one time. Lou and Annie joining us for the entire hour. This is absolutely delightful. Judd and Dubay on fifteen hundred ESPN.